For Rayman's 10th anniversary, Ubisoft released a bundle called Rayman's 10th Anniversary. On Game Boy Advance, it came with two games, Rayman Advance and the portable version of Rayman 3. The PlayStation 2 version included Rayman Arena, Rayman 2 Revolution, and, of course, Rayman 3. However, this home console bundle was only available in Europe. Same goes for the GameCube version, but the GameCube never had Rayman 2 on it, nor did Europe get the updated Rayman Arena. So instead, you got the animated series on DVD. The GameCube doesn't even play DVDs. Well, there is an identical PlayStation 2 version of this, as well as a worldwide PC release. What's going on with Rayman's mouth? Eh, I'll just stick with my Game Boy Advance. Case in point, Rayman Advance, a port of Rayman 1 which was actually a launch title for the Game Boy Advance. Rayman Advance is based on the MS-DOS version of the game, although, reportedly, Digital Eclipse ran into issues getting the original tools to work. So as a result, some data was also used from the PlayStation 1 version. But in many ways, Rayman Advance ended up being its own thing. It begins with the usual introductory scene, which isn't fully animated anymore. Instead, it was chopped up with a few repeating sequences. The music is different too, but that's to be expected when going from CD quality audio to a portable cartridge format in the 2000s. Personally, I've always felt these cheap renditions are rather charming. It's got so many dang flutes that you'd think you're watching a 30s cartoon. Rayman's compressed voice clips definitely contribute to that aura. <laughs> One disappointment is that a lot of the tracks are being used out of place, and the unique boss themes are often replaced by the game's final theme. Although, the Zit's flight theme is intact, who, by the way, looks identical to Mosquito in this version. When I first played, I thought they were the same character. So it was pretty weird to see Rayman beat up the creature he just became friends with. On a related note, it's great to see that the game's full set of animations were left intact. Even those charming sequences where Rayman goofs around with the bosses after a fight. It's all here. Sadly, that level-ending ditty is missing. You might notice that a lot of sound effects have been sped up. <laughs> Compared with the original game, Rayman Advance is presented with a brighter color palette. Being one of the earliest Game Boy Advance games, they had to accommodate the original model's lack of a backlit screen. No matter what model you're using, the game looks really good in hand, running at a silky smooth 60 frames per second. Quite impressive for a handheld at the time. Something you're sure to notice is how big enemies and objects can appear rather pixelated. That's because their sprites were sized up using AGB hardware scaling. It can look unusual at times, especially with the bosses, but it was a necessary move to keep the game running with stable performance. Auto-scrolling sequences push the camera so that Rayman is always at the left of the screen. As a result, you can't easily see what's chasing you. Not knowing that this was a port back when, I thought that was an intentional choice, in order to make their eventual encounter like a second reveal. That is what it feels like. The flaws of this port so far haven't been too serious. However, as the player begins to pass the second world, they'll likely end up noticing its biggest problem. Screen crunch. For many games, this isn't a huge issue, so long as the environments were adjusted for it. A good rule of thumb is to assure that the player can always see the next platform ahead of them, or at the very least, make it obvious enough that the player isn't taking leaps of faith. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like Rayman Advance ever considered this. It's as if the port was designed for experts who know where everything is in advance. Oh, I get it. Let's analyze this gameplay here. Rayman lands on a temporary cloud. You've got a quarter second to figure out where to go before it falls. There are lightning bolts just next to me, so I'll be hurt if I jump forward. I should probably just fall through then, right? Nope. And this is just one example. You'll find yourself in situations like this for the remainder of the game. This happened once. Digital Eclipse tried to balance the port by adding more continues, photographer checkpoints, and one extra hit point for Rayman. It definitely helps, and isn't going overkill like the DSiWare port. Interestingly, 
Certain two health pickups will restore five points of health instead. I recall this more than once in the game, but only noted down this instance of it. Funnily enough, this pickup doesn't exist here in the original Rayman. New item pickups aren't entirely uncommon, though. After all, there's plenty more extra lives to find. So, screen crunched without necessary level tweaks, in exchange for numerous helpful bonuses. Are the accommodations enough? Honestly, despite the frustrations I've had here, I think it is. There are definitely things I'd change, like lowering boss health bars a bit, and removing a couple obstacles the player has virtually no chance of predicting. But ultimately, Rayman Advance is very playable in its released state. Really, it's hard to complain about this one considering ports like Earthworm Jim 2 exist. Now that was an abomination. This last May, the original Rayman Advance press kit surfaced online, and this has a lot of cool stuff in it, including a Q&A from the developers. Here I learned that the development time took close to a year, with an active staff of roughly 30 people. Compressing the beautiful world of Rayman was a challenge for the team, but it all worked out in the end. Oh, Rayman DS. This happens to be the first Rayman game I ever played. At the time, I had no idea that this was just a port of Rayman 2, or that there even was a Rayman 2. This was probably intentional, as there's no mention of it on the game's packaging. So this port was handled by DC Studios. Like Rayman Advance for its platform, Rayman DS was a system launch title. Except not really, because it released a few months later. But I bet it was planned to be. Rayman Advance and 3DS were launch titles for their respective systems, and it's shown on the original Nintendo DS box. You know, it would have made a lot of sense for Rayman 3DS to have been Rayman 3 instead of another port of Rayman 2. There was only a year's difference between this and Rayman 3 HD. You mean to tell me they never thought of it? So this is Rayman DS. Looks a bit jagged, doesn't it? No texture filtering here. This port is based on the Nintendo 64 version of the game. There isn't much of a difference between the two, other than the introduction of new glitches, like this one here during a player-locked cutscene. Not a glitch, but I've never seen that happen before. Some music tracks are shorter than what you're probably used to at this point. Enhanced music was added after the Nintendo 64 release, so while the Hall of Doors usually sounds like this, in Rayman DS, it sounds like this. Now compare Rayman DS's music between its NTSC and PAL release. Yeah, for some reason, the PAL music is totally messed up. Thanks to Pat on Twitter for reminding me of this. It's really bad. Now here's a question for those of you who've played Rayman DS before. When you got to the Tomb of the Ancients level, did it ever freeze on you? I'm curious because, with my original copy, there was a seeming 50-50 chance of being able to pass the first pit without it crashing. At the time I was using an original Titanium Silver model, if that means anything. Somehow I was the only person I knew with one of those. I remember having to convince a friend of mine that it wasn't fake. They were like, what the heck? Why is your Nintendo DS so massive? In terms of performance, Rayman DS is... well, it is less than ideal. While the port is capable of running at 60 frames per second, it hardly ever does. Usually you'll find it running at around 20 to 30. There are rare moments where it becomes borderline unplayable, but this only happened a few times during my playthrough. Navigating in narrow spaces can be incredibly difficult without full analog control. As with the DS, to move diagonally, you'll have to quickly swap between D-pad directions. It's imprecise and awkward. Introducing touchscreen controls. You can move this blue sphere around to control Rayman in 360 degrees. The icon defaults to the left of the screen, and considering that, it was probably meant to be used with the thumb stylus accessory that came with the original DS. Now, I have tried this in Rayman DS before, back when I had one. My impression was that, yeah, it kinda works, but the D-pad's indentations are far easier to recognize than the diameter of the touch icon. I admire that the manual has written techniques for playing this way. Sadly, without the thumb stylus, you'll be using either a generic stylus or your bare thumb. 
Both options suck. Using the stylus simultaneously with the buttons is incredibly strange, and your bare thumb loses tracking every two seconds. Now, the touchscreen can also be used as your camera. Typically, you can't move the screen around with anything other than the shoulder buttons, where a gentle tap will center it. But by holding Y while touching left or right, you can spin the camera around Rayman. It's admittedly kind of pointless, since it instantly moves back to the previous position once you let go. Holding X puts you into first-person mode, where you can use the touchscreen to look around. And this is actually pretty useful, because otherwise you can use the D-pad for this, but it ends up being kind of choppy. The touch screen is equally a control method, as it is your player stats screen. Hey, takes the clutter away from the first screen, so I dig it. Whichever control scheme you end up using, some levels are just downright difficult to play. Take the precipice, for example, where your walking space is narrow, and with the camera's distance, it's hard to visibly trace the platforms you're running on. Jeez, and to think this is the level that they show on the box art. Oh wait, no it's not. Okay, good call on that one. For what could be the best portable Rayman 2 experience today, may I suggest checking out the PS Vita version? PS Vita version? What do you mean? Okay, there is no dedicated Vita version, but you can get Rayman 2 running on it quite smoothly with the Flycast emulator. This emulates Dreamcast, which has what is often considered the best version of Rayman 2. And I totally agree! With the exception of the Isle of Doors, which is a straight downgrade from the Hull of Doors, Candyman SC has a detailed guide on how to get a near-port experience on the Vita, so I'll leave a link to that in the description. Just be sure to set widescreen properly. Unlike me in the first trilogy video, I knew something was off. Well, Rayman Advance and Rayman DS. The games are just as fun today as they've always been, but I can't think of a practical reason to play these versions today. They were appropriate in their time, but that's about it. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to hear more from me in the future, consider subscribing to the channel. Yeah! See you next time!